we are increasingly living in a world where things aren't what they seem. In business, it's not uncommon to see the truth hidden behind the glamour of numbers. Politics is a stage where promises take the spotlight, where the minister's word can mean everything or perhaps nothing. On screen, we actors wear many masks and even the brightest smile can hide the darkest secrets. And even in sports, manipulating the game's outcome is very much a part of strategy and one's quest for victory. So fraud, deceit, illusion, whatever one might call it, it's there everywhere. And in the world of finance, the ability to spot financial shenanigans can mean the difference between prosperity and ruin. Now, the precise origin of the word shenanigans itself is a suspect, and it typically refers to playful or mischievous behavior. The word financial shenanigans is the deliberate manipulation of financial data with a clear intention to mislead investors, government authorities, lenders, and other stakeholders. It's what we call cooking the books, and speaking of books, one absolutely must read, and where a lot of the research for this video comes from is Financial Shenanigans by Howard Shillett. In the video, I'll be covering some of the more common financial frauds and deceits with examples and how we as investors can detect these manipulations and stay away from such companies. Let's begin. Now, even before we get into the specific manipulation techniques, Personally, there are few types of companies I'm anyways a little careful of. For instance, if a company is making acquisitions and especially buying up weaker or non-core companies, then it's possible this company might be hiding something. This is exactly what happened with Satyam Computer Limited when Mr. Ramalinga Raju proposed to acquire a 100% stake in Maitas properties and Maitas infrastructure for over $1.6 billion. These companies were related to his family and Mr. Raju's justification that this would diversify revenue streams did not go well with the shareholders who cited lack of due diligence, conflict of interest and corporate governance issues. This move severely impacted Satyam's credibility and the stock price, which came to a boil a few weeks later when Mr. Raju confessed to a massive financial fraud wherein he had overstated profits by over 7,000 crores. A second scenario where I get a little skeptical is when a private company is about to go public. Understandably, there's an incentive for that company to inflate its earnings as many of the early shareholders will be wanting an exit and a high profit visibility gets them a better valuation. A third cautionary scenario comes in whenever I see a company changing its business model. Now, pivoting to something different is not an issue, but if you think a layer deeper, then the change itself happened because the core business of the company was no longer viable. And as was the case with Enron, a sudden change often leads to manipulation, which happened here through the company's previous accounting principles and policies. And finally, one should be really careful with companies going through operational trouble because that's where the temptation to play hanky-panky with the sales and profit numbers is really high. We'll discuss more on this in the coming sections, but generally speaking, sometimes the situation itself can give us a clue on what to expect from it. All right, let's draw a basic framework. Now, the big objective, the goal for any company is to increase its net profits and profits are nothing but the revenue minus the expenses. So if I want to manipulate the profits, clearly I have to manipulate the revenues or distort the expenses. Or if I want to go Gordon Gecko, then I'll do both of them. Understandably, there are plenty of reasons why a manager would be interested in making profits appear higher than what they are today. There's too much pressure from the shareholders, maybe the senior management's jobs are in danger, or perhaps they are desperate for a loan, the company might be going public, etc. Actually, with respect to the last point, the sales growth and revenue fabrication that Luckin Coffee did in the lead up to its 2019 IPO can be a good example. And for your benefit, I have attached some related material in this video's description. A second objective and probably a weird one on why some managers distort numbers is to deflate, yes, reduce their current earnings. If you're wondering why someone would want to do that, well, there can be many reasons, including the fact that the company might want to create a reserve for a rainy day, or maybe because the team has already achieved its target for the year, or perhaps the company is getting bought and the buyer wants to justify the acquisition by showing an excellent first quarter and stuff like that. Actually, let me give you an example here. 
So many years back, Heinz, the ketchup company, had this bonus system that was based on net profits, but only up to a certain threshold. This meant managers had an incentive to deflate earnings in the current period once the threshold was achieved, and that is exactly what they did. As a result, the profits of the company were suppressed, although they were doing extremely well, and this should give all of us this realization on how scary this two-way manipulation of financial statements can be and why it is important for us to study this well. Let's start on the revenue side, and as a guiding principle, revenues should be recorded after the earnings process has been completed and an exchange of product or service has occurred. So essentially, companies that violate this principle are the ones who record revenue when there is still a lot of work to be done. And this is easier done than said in long-term service contracts where the creative accountant would book the upfronted money as immediate sales even though the delivery of service will be across many years. This is exactly what happened in the case of Baiju's, whose revenues in FY21 were flat as compared to the previous year, while the expenses were up two and a half times. The reason this happened is because Baiju's had been following an aggressive revenue recognition policy until then, which means if a parent paid for, let's say, a 10-year Baiju's subscription, then the company was counting all of it as this current year's revenue. This obviously impressed investors and Baiju's became the world's biggest edtech company. But then their auditors, Deloitte, came back to them with a revised revenue recognition policy which was compliant with the Indian Accounting Standard 115 rules that said revenue projected in one financial year for a multi-year fee cannot be used as that year's revenue alone. Consequently, what was originally reported as 4,000 crores of revenue had to be reconfigured and this came to around 1,800 crores. In that context, many service-based companies, so mobile service providers, OTT platforms, those big bulky printers in our office, all these have a similar structure. But from what I've seen, some companies tend to adopt an aggressive revenue recognition policy while others are more conservative. This is where investors should do a common size analysis, which is the comparison of a company across similar sized companies within the same sector to check for consistencies and deviations. For instance, when Kunal was comparing the revenues of two-wheeler companies, what stood out, especially in FY21 and FY22, was the divergence in the performance of one company from the other. I'm not saying this is fraud, but it's certainly a warning sign to any prudent investor who should now identify the reasons for this anomaly, which we have learned by now might be complex and conniving. Another way of boosting revenue is channel stuffing, which happens when the company pushes a lot more volumes to its distributors and stores relative to what its customers are likely to buy in a reasonable amount of time. Understandably, this is done to make it look like the company's product is selling like hotcakes, which boosts up the sales number and profits in the short run. But over the long run, all this mal chepne wala kaam is generally not sustainable. But companies, especially manufacturing companies, still do it as it not only boosts the revenue, but it also helps in keeping the competition at bay. As an example, I found this one tweet or whatever it is called on X now. So this one was by SOIC where their investigation revealed some leading paints company resorting to channel stuffing. And if I have to guess, this might be Asian paints because there was also some news of increased competition from JSW paints during the same time, which was even escalated to the Competition Commission of India. Anyways, as investors, a key metric to look out for is the company's receivables as a percentage of sales. And if this number is trending higher than normal, then there might be something going on there. But just to be on the safer side, firstly, give a higher emphasis on receivables that are outstanding for more than 180 days. And secondly, also compare the percentage increase in sales with the percentage increase in receivables before coming to any conclusions. All right, if you think doing all this channel stuffing and making changes to the company's accounting policies is hard work, then you aren't wrong, which is why some companies and their unscrupulous management resort to simply creating revenue from thin air. Maybe these guys got impressed by Farzi. But some of the simplest tricks in the Farzi playbook includes recording sales even when it's very doubtful if the customer is going to be able to pay up, the use of side agreements wherein customers receive guaranteed buybacks, discounts or refunds that are not part of the official sales contract, falsely calling lending transactions as revenue instead of recording it as debt, 
and recognizing revenue for a sale before delivering the product to the customer. But my favorite scene in this movie is the recording of phantom sales and the case of Urja Global is a very interesting one. So in 2019, Urja Global Limited got into an agreement with Japan's Nippon Shinyaku Limited to supply $65 million worth of Zacobite. This seemed like a simple buy-sell transaction between the two companies until a whistleblower contacted the Japanese company for confirmation and was surprised to know that the Shinyaku guys had never heard of Urja Global and they even added a warning that perhaps this entire thing was a fraud. Expectedly, this was escalated to the SEBI, who investigated the matter and in spite of searching everywhere, they could not find a single reference to this word Zacobite. I mean, try it yourself, Google it, try Wikipedia, ask ChatGPT, but it's very likely you'll come up empty-handed because the fact is, there is nothing called a Zacobite and it's just a fictitious material which Urja Global had made up with the intention of misleading investors amounting to $65 million in revenue. So between policy changes, upfronting revenue, pushing sales, making a fictitious revenue and also deferring the revenue, I think creative accountants have many tools at their disposal, but so do we as investors and getting to the truth will always be like a chore police kahani. So the big picture is very important and a must read for all serious investors is the monthly cap view by Fisdom Research. The September report has just been released, which beautifully complies the key macroeconomic indicators, including private capex, credit growth, quarterly earnings, fiscal deficit, and over a dozen other parameters. It carries a detailed understanding of the equity markets with what's happening internationally in the mid cap and small cap space and even sector rotation. What are the important sectoral trends featuring realty, auto, industrial, capital goods, telecom, banking, healthcare, and others? and also an overview of the fixed income market which covers inflation, interest rates and the yield curve. So there's a lot here and you too can access it by subscribing or downloading the report from FISDOM.com absolutely free of cost. As always, the link is available in this video's description. All right, now let's move to the expenses part and the most common ways of manipulating this is by either not recording those expenses or by shifting them to an earlier or later period. And as it often happens, expenses can also be capitalized. Let's start with shifting current expenses to a different time period and the accounting guidelines very clearly require that expenses should be recorded in the period in which the cost has been incurred. It's a fairly simple one, right? But it's not uncommon to see companies not recording invoices on time so as to shift the expense to a later period and on the contrary, they might even pre-book the expense and hold it as a reserve to be released later, a bit like what we saw with the Heinz Ketchup example earlier in the video. In fact, a common way of deferring expenses for later and that by increasing the net profits is by extending the life of an asset. You see, when a company buys any asset, let's say a machine, it has a fair idea of how long that equipment is going to last. Let's assume this is 10 years. And since this machine costs a crore using the straight line method, the company would charge an annual depreciation of 10 lakh rupees. Assuming the operating profit of this company is 25 lakhs. So 25 minus 10 gives us a net profit of 15 lakh rupees. Now say a new CEO has joined the company and without doing much, he wants to show a big jump in profits, to which the CFO's response is to increase the life of that machine to 20 years, which means what was an annual depreciation charge of 10 lakhs now goes down to 5 lakhs, which consequently increases the company's net profits to 20 lakhs or a growth of 33%. Actually, let me explain this with a real life example. So last year, the eye hospital chain, Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital Limited, made a change in the way it calculates depreciation for certain category of assets when it moved from the written down value method to a straight line method. Without getting into specifics, something that the company said in their annual report caught my eye, no pun intended. So it said in that report that had the company continued its previous method of written down value for these assets, the depreciation expense for FY23 would have been higher by 5.58 crores. So essentially, Dr. Agarwal's eye hospital, due to a change in its depreciation policy, was able to add an additional 5.5 crores to its net profits, which is quite a bit for a company whose operating profits were just 76 crores in the last financial year. 
Another manipulation many companies resort to is where they definitely spend the money, but instead of showing it under expenses in the PL account, they instead take that entry into the balance sheet as an asset. Let me explain this. So according to generally accepted accounting principles, an enterprise should be capitalizing costs that are incurred to produce a future benefit and should be expensing those that produce no multi-year benefit. Understandably, this allows companies to invest in areas that can generate profits over longer time periods. So expenses like R&D costs, cost of software development, the buying of patents and copyrights, the cost of acquiring land, buildings, machinery, cargo planes, etc. And while all of it seems extremely fair, it's very easy for a creative accountant to fiddle with it as now he or she can easily capitalize a cost that certainly should be identified as an operating one. For example, in 2014, the auditors of Global Spirits Limited found that the company has been capitalizing its advertising and promotional expenses into the balance sheet as intangible assets, while what they should have been doing is to take these costs as an expense in the PL account. This effectively means the pre tax profit declared by the company was exaggerated by 36 crores. And after this was pointed out by the auditors, the company graciously deducted these expenses as 7.2 crores of additional depreciation over the next five years. In fact, this was the secret sauce behind the early profitability shown by Reliance Geo, wherein they had capitalized expenses worth 14,500 crores in FY17, which were actually on account of operating expenses. Now, one of the very effective ways of checking expense manipulation is to focus on the company's cash flow from operations, and it provides a direct measure of a company's ability to generate cash through its core business activities, and it's a bit hard to manipulate. So conceptually, a straight and clean company should be able to convert its EBITDA into cash flow on a medium to long term basis. And per SOIC, the ideal CFO to EBITDA ratio is 60% for B2B companies and 70% for B2C companies. In addition to this metric, also look out for the company's cash position, its current ratio and also its free cash flow to get a measure of whether the company has been recording its revenue and expense transactions properly or not. So we've covered some of the shenanigans Mr. Shillett mentioned in his book, and I'm sure you would have realized by now that these distortions can be ranked from the accidentally benign to an outright fraud. For instance, any changes made in the accounting policies are like an orange flag. The capitalizing of operating costs is a bit more severe, but if a company is creating fictitious revenue, then this is the worst, and one should definitely stay away from such companies. Now, identifying these situations via a thorough investigation of the company's financial statements can be quite consuming and difficult for many of us. But certain parts of the financials are more important than the other, and a good place to start is the auditor's report. Actually, this makes perfect sense because we are trying to detect manipulation and because a good auditor has already spent hundreds of hours examining the company's reporting, this report does require a good read from you. Once that's done, I'll want to look at the annual report for related party transactions as that's where the hanky-panky stuff mostly happens. I'll also want to check out the section on management discussion and analysis, the MD and A, to see if the management is trying to give a positive twist to any unfavorable developments. Thirdly, look out for any lawsuits and other contingencies. And very important, always examine the footnotes. In fact, there's an old joke amongst the analyst community that goes something like, if the best place to bury a body is where the fewest number of people are likely to find it, the footnotes in a company's financial statements is the ideal graveyard. To conclude, the artful manipulation of revenue, earnings and profits to create the illusion of economic prosperity is a widespread practice that not only erodes the trust in the financial markets, but can be quite damaging to our own investment portfolio as well. So keep your eyes and ears open and over time you'll find it a lot easier to recognize the patterns. I sincerely hope you found this video useful and informative. Do like this video, share it with others and I'll see you three days from now. Until then.